Well, good morning and happy Father's Day to all those to whom that applies this morning, whether you're one of the old, experienced, crusty fathers like me or one of the newbies. Um, I know we have some maybe fellows celebrating their first Father's Day today. And happy Father's Day to all of you and anybody in between. I do want to mention again, as Eric did, our VBS uh, starting next Sunday. Um, a lot of work going into that, and now it's a matter of getting the, the kiddos here. And if you haven't had yours registered, please do so. And we'd really like to invite people, uh, friends, and so forth from the community. I've got a stack of these invitations available. I'll set those out in the foyer. Um, so you can pick one up if you want to hand it to somebody or post it someplace. Um, we encourage you to do that right away and so they'll have time to, to um, be a part of VBS. We're going to be studying David's life. It's going to be a great week. Looking forward to it and hope you will be a part of it. We've all heard the old saying, charity begins at home. I want to borrow that today and adapt it a little to say, that Christianity begins at home. Christian living begins at home. At the beginning of the book of Colossians, in chap um, actually in chapter 3, beginning of chapter 3 of Colossians, it says this, Seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. And then it says, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So we are to be obviously heavenly minded people. But that could be misunderstood and misapplied. And sometimes it is. Some people, it's been said, are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. And part of the problem, I think, at Colossae that called forth this letter from the apostle was people like this. They were all about spiritual things. They liked to think and talk about spiritual things, but it didn't really affect their day-to-day -day lives, how they lived. Well, that cannot be. Having become citizens of heaven by getting into Christ is really supposed to transform our daily lives in the here and now. And so if you read the beginning of Colossians 3, the first 17 verses of Colossians 3, that's what you'll, uh, that's what you'll see. Um, and, and as we move on, we'll see how this develops. It will not do for somebody to say that they're devoted to Jesus in heaven, but then to mistreat their brother or sister here on earth. It's not either heaven or earth, you see. It, it's not an either or thing, it's both and. We are to be both heavenly minded and also transformed in the way we live here on earth. So it's fascinating to me here in Colossians chapter 3, that the very first practical examples of, of what the apostle is talking about, of where this should take effect, that is, heavenly-minded living, the practical examples he gives, the very first ones, are in the home. So we're talking about beginning at verse 18 of Colossians 3 and, and going through the first verse of chapter 4. We have instructions here to wives and to husbands, to children and to parents, to fathers, and then also for Paul's first century context in a society that was dominated by the practice of slavery, you have instructions to masters and slaves. It might be a little bit hard for us to imagine the, the application of that, but maybe we can think in terms of employer-employee. But today, being Father's Day, 
I want us to lock in on the instruction to fathers in verse 21. Uh, let's, let's read a few verses of this to set the stage, though. So we're going to begin in verse 18, Colossians 3, and read through verse 21. It begins this way. Paul writes, Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. You have to sort of imagine a world where children were really considered property of the father. Uh, many were viewed as little more than slaves, that is, children. And so the father, for instance, could decide if they, he, he would even keep and raise the child when it was born, or whether instead the child might be exposed, that is, taken out into the forest and left to die. We think of barbaric practices with unborn children today in our culture in the Roman world it often happened to children even after birth so the father totally controlled the lives of the children if he so chose he made the decisions uh, he gave permission to marry he often arranged the marriage uh, he decided who they would marry, who the son would marry, who the daughter would marry. He could even force or compel a divorce if he wanted to. And this control over them lasted throughout their life, not just until they were married off. That was what life was like in the Greek and, and Roman world of the first century. That's the, the context of the culture of this letter to the Colossians. The father was a dictator in the family. Hopefully, if you were lucky, he was a benevolent one, but he was a dictator nonetheless. Today, in, in my family, I won't even get to decide where we go out to eat for Father's Day. <laughs> no? Now, I might get to decide, but it has to be one in agreement, you see. But we, that's why I said we sort of have to imagine this contact, context, Colossians 3, 21. And think of how radical a word this was for these people at this time. Listen to it again. Fathers... Do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. That is a radical word for the first century. Now you might say that's not so radical for us today, and I think you're, you're right. Uh, the radical verse for us might be the previous one. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. That might seem pretty radical to our culture, the basic theme of the entire letter to the Colossians is Christ is the center. Christ at the center of all things. I want you to notice it just here in, in what we've read, how Jesus is in the middle of everything. Verse 18, you notice it says, as is fitting in the Lord. And then verse 20, notice, for this pleases the Lord. And then verse 22, we have the phrase, fearing the Lord. And then verse 23, work heartily as for the Lord. And then verse 24, you are serving the Lord Christ. Just every verse in this paragraph. Jesus is at the center. See, in this section on what goes on at home, in the family, Jesus 
is at the center of it all. Jesus is the reason. He's the inspiration for living this way. And so, if I fail my family, if I destroy my home, who do I really fail? The Lord. What goes on at home is serious business, folks. What happens Monday through Saturday at 2310 Scenic Drive Northeast, in my case, had better reflect what happens on Sunday at 1779 Granville Pike. Or something is, is seriously awry in my spiritual life. My profession of faith on the Lord's day had better match my practice of faith during the week inside my home. The home is the laboratory where the experiment of Christian living is worked out. And fathers, just a word of warning here. If your kids see inconsistency here between what you profess and what you practice, Good luck getting them to make your faith their faith. It doesn't work that way. I think I've been doing this long enough now. I guess 30 years is long enough to have seen multiple times where a, a father came to me brokenhearted that his son or daughter or, or maybe all of them have left the faith. And sometimes I knew why. Because it was all about what happened on Sunday and none of it applied to the rest of the week. Colossians 3, verses 1 through 17, the part that talks about being heavenly minded, is empty talk if it's not lived out, as in Colossians 3, 18 through 4, 1. All that stuff about being raised with Christ, being heavenly minded, putting to death sin in our lives, all the stuff about putting on the new self and letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, and singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs to God, all that wonderful stuff, those verses we like to quote, that spiritual Sunday stuff is made a lie if it doesn't translate to how wives treat husbands and husbands treat wives, how children respond to parents, and how fathers lead their kids. If it doesn't translate, Frankly, it's all made a lie. That's why Paul put it here where he did. You see. Saying it another way, Colossians 3 verse 12 is practiced and worked out in the family. What do I mean by that? What's, what's 312 say? It says, put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. That is worked out. That is lived out, proven, shown to be real and genuine, first and foremost in the home, in the family. And if it's a lie in the family, it's a lie in the church house. But if you can accomplish those things at home, if you can live those principles at home, you can live them anywhere. So back to verse 
21, dads, Christian fathers, what does it say to us today? Don't provoke your children lest they become discouraged. What does this mean? What, what provokes and discourages? The word means something like to irritate. Uh, but it's more than a minor irritation. I have three girls, two of them are here this morning. They could all testify and would shout amen if I said I like to irritate my kids. But only in a minor way. You know, I like to have fun with them. And, but but this, this kind of provoking or irritating that Paul is talking about is a lifestyle. It is a constant practice. It's a, it's a nagging style of, of parenting. It's belittling. It's being overly harsh. It's being constantly negative. Abuse clearly would be an example of this, whether it's physical or, or mental or verbal. Violence, of course, would cause, would cause this irritation, this provoking. Paul says, don't be provokers of children. The New International Version helps us a little bit here. It says, don't embitter them. Another possibility is don't make them resentful. Maybe the positive expression of this would be most helpful. Now what would the opposite of provoking be? Be sensitive to your children. Think of their needs their hopes and dreams, their well-being as you father them. Because you see in the second half of the verse, you see what the concern is. We're talking about verse 21 again. The concern is their faith. If you provoke them, they might become discouraged. Discouraged in what? Their faith. This is all in the context of faith. It's all in the Lord, right? So, Father, what a responsibility you have to introduce your children to the Lord, to teach your children about the Lord and his word, and to help nurture the faith of those children in the Lord. And this verse it really gives a stark warning. Don't provoke them. Don't chase them away from the Lord. And so, you know, we can, as believers, as Christians, we can talk faith and Bible and church all day long, and that's fine and good. Being involved in the Lord's church is important. Being faithful is expected. All that's great. But home is where it is shown most clearly, where it is lived out, where it's proven. So thank you, fathers, for showing us at home that what you sing and teach and preach on Sunday is real every day. Thank you. I, I heard of a father one time whose family had a custom every Friday night was family night in their, in their home. And they would go out to a movie together or a ball game or something, do something together on Friday night. When they came home uh, afterward, they would always make a fire in the fireplace and pop popcorn. They would enjoy it together. Well, one of, one of those family evenings, little Billy um, had not behaved too well. While they were out, made a real pest of himself in the car on the drive home. And so, being consistent in his parenting, when they got home, Billy was punished. He was sent to his room while the rest of the family enjoyed popcorn by the fire. Well, this was Billy's favorite thing. It crushed him. 
as you can imagine. And, and so after the family got the fire going, got the popcorn cooking, Billy's father went back to his room and said something to the little boy that he would never, ever forget. And neither would the rest of the family. He said, Billy, you go out there with the others. I'll stay here and take your punishment. What a way to build faith in a little boy's heart. What a way to show that the gospel of Jesus Christ is real in a family. Fathers, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Our prayers are with you as you strive to do so. We're not here this morning to say this is easy. Our prayers are with you, and as a church, we want to support you and help you any way we can in your awesome task and to build you up in that and encourage you as you strive to raise them in the Lord. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this your day. You are the great Father. We love you, and we want to be more like your son. And we want as parents to pass on belief and faith to those children you bless us with. We're trying to do this. We, we fail. Please forgive us. Make us stronger and better and help us to rely on your word and on one another as we hold each other's arms up in, in this task. Thank you for hearing us today. Please bless us as we go out with the good news this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you this morning for listening. God bless fathers. Today, if we can be of assistance to you by praying for you, or maybe it's the day that you want to say yes to Jesus and obey his gospel, we could baptize you before we leave. What a celebration that would be. Whatever it might be, if we can help you today, please let us know. As together we stand and sing this song.